The War of the Spanish Succession is one of the most important, but least well known and underexplored wars of early modern Europe, involving quite literally all important Western European powers, with chiefly Britain, Portugal, the Dutch and the Habsburgs standing against the French and the Spanish. There was real fear that this war had the potential to decide the future of Europe. The French were fighting to install Philip V, the grandson of Louis XIV, on the Spanish throne opening the doors to a close Franco-Spanish alliance, or, if dynastic shenanigans go wrong, even a full Franco-Spanish union. On the opposing side were the Habsburgs, who were fighting to install Charles VI on the Spanish throne. This same Charles would later inherit the Austrian domains, leading to a possibility of a renewed Austro-Spanish Habsburg Empire. In our timeline, after almost 14 years of conflict, the war would come to a compromise end. Philip V would become the King of Spain, but he would need to abandon his place in the French succession tree. The Spanish would also need to cede their territories in Italy to Austria and Savoy, reducing the threat of a future joint Franco-Spanish power play in Italy. A similar story too takes place in the Lowlands, where the Spanish have to cede the Lower Lowlands to the Austrians too, in order to prevent future French ventures into Germany. With this, a new Europe was forged, with a massively reduced Bourbon Spain. But in this video, we will go into one of the possible alternate timelines where the French, rather than signing this compromise peace deal, come out massively successful during the war, achieving most of their goals, at least in so far as we can still remain realistic. How would France go about this, and how would Europe develop as a result? Well, before we can dive into the actual scenario, we need to meet the prize of this entire war, Spain. A long time ago, in an era now long gone, Spain used to be undoubtedly the most powerful Christian state, with perhaps only the Ottomans a strong enough rival to contest them in a 1v1 situation. They ruled over rich lands in Italy and the Lowlands, while being in a personal union with the Austrians. This is not to mention the massive colonial empire centered around the Americas, which the Spanish would hold on to until the Napoleonic Wars. Even when the Spanish and the Austrians were no longer ruled by the same monarch, their dynastic ties ensured that they continued to dominate European politics together for centuries. But that was about a century and a half ago now, and the Spanish realm has lost its position of power. The French have begun to eclipse the Habsburgs, slowly pushing back against the Spanish borders. The rich provinces of the northern lowlands have broken away, reducing the relevance of the remaining southern lowlands for Spain. Costly wars with the French, British, Ottomans, Dutch and more have exhausted the coffers of the empire, while the crazy amount of precious metals extracted from the Americas has mostly resulted in mass inflation, as Spain went bankrupt a couple of times and very few of the profits of the empire were reinvested into their economy. This would lead to the other Western European powers slowly eclipsing the Spanish in terms of economy and even power. By 1700, at the start of the War of the Spanish Succession, Spain was bankrupt with a limited army and navy. Still among the major powers of Europe, but the days of Spain being a deciding influence in European geopolitics was over. But this doesn't mean that Spain wasn't still a very valuable prize, worthy to be fought over. Spain falling under complete French or Habsburg control, still has the potential to destroy the balance of power in Europe should they manage to restore and fully utilize the potential that Spain's massive empire still has. So when Charles II of Spain, this absolute beautiful man, passed away, it was Philip V of Bourbon who inherited the throne and the pieces for a massive European war were beginning to be set. The British, in negotiations with Louis XIV, had explained that they were open to remaining neutral if a compromise could be reached that wouldn't threaten British commerce. At the same time, French forces were openly taking positions in Spanish territory, most notably throwing the Dutch out of border fortresses they occupied in the southern lowlands, leading to the Dutch siding with the Austrians as well. The French were unwilling to compromise with the British over the status of Sicily, as Britain considered French control over the island threatening to their Mediterranean trading interests. Thus, resulting in Britain too siding with the Austrians as war kicked off. The French quickly seemed on the back foot, as the French and Spanish were soon pushed out of the southern lowlands, leading to the French putting up a defensive posture in the north. Over in Italy, despite the entrance of Savoy into the war, we initially see a massive French victory, as northern Italy was temporarily occupied, but here too, a successful Habsburg counteroffensive would manage to push the French out. In Iberia, the Portuguese had sided with the Habsburgs, while a revolt in Catalonia would distract the French. The British would attempt to break Spain in the Siberian theater a couple of times, 
but they would fail every single time. But the most interesting front was the German-Austrian one. The Bavarians had sided with the French, putting major pressure on the Austrians, while a revolt in Hungary was shaking the Habsburg monarchy to its core. Should the French manage to defeat the Austrians here, Hungary could have broken away. In our timeline, the Austrians managed to defeat the Bavarians, and while the Hungarian revolt would last for most of the war, they too would eventually be defeated. It was in this stalemate that the war remained for years, as neither side could break the other, resulting in the compromise peace deal of our timeline. But during this war, there were a couple of clear weaknesses for France to exploit. First, the British were fully paying for the forces of the bankrupted Dutch, while also heavily subsidizing the struggling Austrians. Additionally, while I have been talking in terms of a France against Austria for most of this video, that's not really a correct way of looking at this war. France was fighting to control Spain, and so was Austria. But it would be wrong to say that the three powers of Britain, the Netherlands, and the Portuguese really wanted Austria to win either. These three powers simply wanted neither France nor Austria to fully dominate Spain, preferring compromise instead. The Dutch, for example, were fighting to keep control over several Spanish border fortresses. The British, meanwhile, were fighting for their own selfish economic reasons and to prevent the French from gaining all of Spain and becoming too powerful. With this, it should become more than clear how France could achieve victory in this war. Britain absolutely carried the war effort, so France managing to compromise to secure British neutrality would be a massive step towards a French victory. So let's look at some partition plans discussed in our timeline before the war to get an idea of what a compromise might look like. The first was one where Joseph Ferdinand would take the Spanish throne. He was a kid that wasn't a Bourbon or a Habsburg, and as such, he provided a useful and acceptable third candidate for all. As compensation for giving up on the Spanish succession, France would gain Naples and Sicily, as well as parts of the Spanish Basque lands. The Austrians, for their part, would receive Milan, which they considered crucial for Austria's southern defense. A plan that all sides could agree to, it would fall through upon the untimely death of Joseph Ferdinand. The next attempt would come from negotiations between King Louis XIV and King William of Great Britain. Again, France was to gain some lands from Spain, while Charles of Habsburg would be allowed to gain the Spanish throne, ensuring Habsburg rule over the rest of the Spanish domains. France was then set to trade Naples and Sicily to Savoy in exchange for Savoy and Nice. This time though, it was the Habsburgs who would reject this proposal as France would be the one to control Milan, which, as mentioned before, the Habsburgs considered crucial to control to secure their southern borders. With this, compromise fell through and we enter the war that we know from our own timeline. But as we dive into the war, let's remember this willingness to compromise from the British and the Dutch, while diving into an alternate world where the war quickly turned sour for the Habsburgs. The biggest opportunity for France would come when Bavaria joined their side, and a joint French-Bavarian invasion of Austria became a real possibility. At this point of the war, Italy had been pacified and the Hungarians were revolting as well. But saving the Austrians from disaster was the most crucial battle of Blenheim. It was here that the Austrians managed to fend off the French attack, ending the threat on Austria by occupying Bavaria. It is at this point where we can force a French victory in the war. Through luck, skill, or whatever else, the French and Bavarians achieve more victories marching closer and closer to Vienna. Combining this with the success of the Hungarian revolt, we could very well see the collapse of Habsburg fighting capabilities and the forced exit of Austria from the war. Now don't think that the French would dismantle the Habsburg Empire. That would be very extreme and likely lead to condemnation from just about every other state. But what we can assume is that Hungarian independence would be successful, reducing the size of the Habsburg dominions, while Austria would be forced to relinquish any claim upon the Spanish throne or Spanish territories. At this point, the rest of the war would still continue, as the English and the Dutch are still likely to have achieved victories in the lowlands, and Britain does still have the superior navy. At the same time, stirrings in Portugal and Catalonia keep the Iberian front open too. Under this alternate stalemate, the two sides would meet to discuss compromise. And this is where, and I'm sorry for this, we need to dive into the French line of succession, as it's crucial to understanding the motivations behind the powers at this alternate peace deal, as well as the peace deal of our own timeline. At the start of the war, the succession was as follows. From Louis XIV to Louis the Grand Dauphin, then to Louis the Petit Dauphin, and then, as this fourth Louis was as of yet unborn, Philip next, the same Philip who would become the King of Spain. 
That meant that at this time, the idea of Philip becoming the King of France and Spain was relatively unlikely. The Grand Dauphin was only 39 years old and surely had some years of rulership in him, while the Petit Dauphin was only 18 years old and would surely rule for decades. The chance of both dying before the Petit Dauphin got to foster his own child, who would supersede Philip in the line of succession, was very slim. But that was the situation in 1700, before the war had begun. In 1713, when negotiations began in our timeline, things had changed. Both Dauphins had tragically passed away before Louis XIV himself. This left Louis, the great-great-grandson of Louis XIV, next in line for succession, meaning that Philip, the King of Spain, was second in line for the throne. Young Louis was only three years old, and as his father and grandfather had proven, death could come at any age, especially for a young child, sparking fears in Europe that the untimely death of a single toddler could lead to the unification of France and Spain under a single monarch. This uncertain diplomatic situation would lead to the British insisting that Philip had to abandon his place in the French line of succession before any peace could be agreed upon. But in this alternate timeline which we have created, this uncertain line of succession does not yet exist. Philip is still only third in line for the French throne, and everyone assumes that there's plenty of time for the Petit Dauphin to foster a child of his own to replace Philip in the line of succession. What this means is that peace is easier to find, as the British have much less of a fear of Philip becoming the joint king of France and Spain. With that out of the way, let's dive into negotiations between the remaining combatants. First, Philip gets recognized as the King of Spain while keeping his place in the French line of succession. This already is a major victory for Louis XIV, who gets his grandson the throne of Spain while not having been humiliated by having to strip that same grandson from succession. But then, the compromises do have to start with two main points of contention. The British were unhappy with French dominance over southern Italy as it threatened trading interests in the Mediterranean, while French domination over the southern lowlands was an unappealing prospect for both France and the Dutch. Interestingly, a potential solution to the lowlands dispute both sides could agree upon was allowing Bavaria to control these lands instead. The French had proposed this in our timeline, as Bavaria had been a valuable French ally in the war, who expected to be rewarded for this fact. The Dutch would also be allowed to keep control over several forts in the Bavarian lowlands to satisfy their wishes too. Over in Italy, the compromise would likely center around the restoration of Savoy. Savoy would obviously regain their independence, and likely be allowed to at least take Sicily, if not Naples as well, depending on how powerful France is in negotiations, to reduce fears of French domination over Italy. Especially if Savoy gains Naples as well, France would likely take border territories in the Alps, reaching their natural borders. While it may not look like a fair trade to France, having control over these Alpine territories would likely be much more appealing than having control over southern Italy, a territory disconnected from their mainland. With this, we have created a new Europe that everyone, apart from Austria, can be relatively content with. In terms of the Spanish inheritance, Spain's European territories have still been massively reduced, much like in our timeline, but Spain still controls the important territory of Milan as well as Sardinia. In our timeline, Britain also took control over Gibraltar, Menorca and Malta to increase their control over the Mediterranean. In this alternate timeline, it's very well possible that Britain doesn't gain any of these territories, or perhaps only one of them, reducing British power in the western Mediterranean. But now the question becomes, what's next? Some alternate history writers that I've seen have France, with their new coalition of allies, completely dominate Europe following this war. I think this is very unlikely, as the war of the Spanish succession itself proves that even France and Spain together cannot dominate the other great powers of Europe. As long as Britain can sit on their island, protected by their navy, building up their economic power, Britain will always be able to bankroll anti-French coalitions, and most of Europe would still be unhappy to just accept French domination. Adding to this, we should also never forget the sorry state that the Spanish are still in, and it will take decades at least to restore Spain to a truly respectable position in European politics. Luckily for Spain though, as an administrator, Philip V was very capable. Under the Habsburgs, Spain had been greatly decentralized, but as new Bourbon rulers, Philip could completely restructure the Spanish government, streamlining the Spanish economy and administration. Still, on the European stage, he was a bit of a wild card. 
A common misconception is that now Bourbon Spain and Bourbon France would become unbreakable allies, but I don't think that this is necessarily true. In our timeline too, Philip was deeply insecure and unhappy about the territory he lost. In 1718, the Spanish invaded both Sardinia and Sicily, leading to Spain going to war with Austria and Savoy, with soon Britain and even France joining against the Spanish. That's right, only three years after the War of Spanish Succession, Bourbon France and Bourbon Spain were already fighting each other. So, again, will France and Spain just simply dominate Europe after this war? No, they wouldn't be strong enough to, even if we assume that France and Spain are completely united in foreign policy, which is just untrue. But still, just because a scenario doesn't end in one side dominating Europe, doesn't mean that Europe isn't still very significantly changed in this timeline. Let's start with one of the largest changes. The separation of Hungary from the Habsburg domains has the potential for major changes in Eastern Europe. Most of Hungary had only recently been conquered by the Habsburgs from the Ottomans, putting Austria in a position to participate in the downfall of the Turks. Instead, the Habsburgs are now in a relatively weak position in the East, while also in a terrible position regarding the French. Their worst case scenario has become true as the two significant territories of Lombardia and Italy, as well as the southern lowlands, are lost to Austria. Meaning that any future French expansion would now be more difficult for the Austrians to counter. To continue on in Germany, we have now created a much more powerful Bavarian state which will have huge ramifications into the future. Especially with the Bavarians set to inherit some other territories later on in the century, we have a true potential for Bavaria to become an extremely powerful state in southern Germany. Perhaps even becoming to southern Germany what Prussia was to the north. In a similar vein, we have created a new dominant state in Savoy. Gaining control over Sicily and Naples makes it a major power while their location, right next to France, makes them a natural and consistent ally of the British as well as the Austrians, giving a significant rise to their diplomatic standing as well. When Europe, inevitably, falls back into another great power conflict, Savoy would surely be eyeing up the French territory of Milan, and were they to be successful in gaining this territory, they would be in a great place to position themselves as the great power of Italy. So, in my opinion, this alternate timeline would be completely different to our own. Though in more of a death by a thousand cuts way, than in a front and Spain completely dominate Europe way. This alternate peace deal has set up some changes which will have massive ripple effects into the future, but some of the main lines are still the same as in our own timeline. France and Spain are close allies, but not fully unified, and they are still playing the European geopolitical game, much like in our timeline. At the same time, whatever France does, Britain is sure to oppose them, and I could not, in good conscience, make any realistic or specific predictions as to what would happen. In terms of my personal hope for this scenario, however, is that the following decades would see Savoy establish itself as a true major power ensuring that Italy is no longer just a playground between Austrian and French influences, but a region with our own influence and autonomy. In a similar vein, the rise of Bavaria as a great power would radically change the power dynamic in Germany going forwards. Instead of Austria standing as the proponent of German division against Prussia's plan to closer unify Germany, we would have Bavaria serve as the third power the southern Catholic contender for German unification against the northern Protestant Prussians. But this is the map at the end of my scenario. Where do you think that Europe goes from here? Will the Franco-Spanish alliance win in this alternate timeline, or will future Franco-British war still exhaust the French, leading to the downfall of the Bourbons? Either way, this is where I'll end this video. Thank you all for watching, consider leaving a like and a comment to support the content, subscribe for two more videos every single week. To continue watching, click on one of the two videos now on screen. Again, thank you all for watching, and goodbye.